Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session. My name is Ryan Beach. I'm a journalist from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. It's a great privilege for me to be able to lead this very important conversation. And this is one of the most important conversations we will have during this forum. Just before we begin, I just want to encourage you, there's a poll that will show up on your screen. We do encourage you to take the poll. It'll be very interesting to see where many of you are from and what sphere and sector do you belong to. It will be incredible to learn a lot more about our audience over the next half hour. Thank you very much for joining us. You know, many countries uh, depend on fossil fuels and, uh, you know, they're reliant on fossil fuels for the development of their economies. And now they face, they're faced with a predicament when economic progress is pegged to the production of oil and gas, but that in turn is accelerating the warming of our own planet. We have a major balancing problem on our hands. Uh, and it's to say one nation that is attempting to balance uh, to that balancing act is Guyana. As NPR put it, Guyana is um, an emerging country, one of the world's newest oil producers at a time when world leaders are under pressure to reduce their country's reliance on oil, coal, and natural gas. But Guyana is making a case for meeting environmental targets while managing an economic portfolio intertwined with oil and gas production. Uh, just before I, I introduce my guests, I just want to uh, release some figures from the poll. I think we might have some figures already. Maybe we don't just yet. But I have the honor of welcoming to this session Guyana's Foreign Secretary, Mr. Robert Passad. Mr. Passad, there we go. We have just before Mr. Passad comes on, a lot of us from the Caribbean, 46% are from the Caribbean. We've got some Europeans in. Welcome to everyone. North America, just about 8%. South and Central America, 15%. Welcome to everyone, wherever you are watching in the world. A very good day to you. Thank you very much for joining us. I have the honor of welcoming to this session Guyana's Foreign Secretary, Mr. Robert Passad. Mr. Passad has expertise in oil and gas policy, environmental management, integrated natural resources management and the production and management of the extractive industry. Mr. Secretary, we are absolutely honored to have you on this Island Innovation Session. Thank you very much for joining us. The pleasure is mine and, and I also want to extend a welcome to all your participants and, and certainly to yourself as the, uh, as the moderator of this session. So it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Foreign Secretary, you are Foreign Secretary of Guyana, and like many other countries across the world, Guyana is now faced with a balancing act between fossil fuels and the future of our environment. How challenging is it to have to balance uh, you know, your crude oil production, your oil and gas production with your environmental targets? Well, you know, um, in 2019, Guyana joined the League of Oil Producing Countries, and that is. Um, and since then, we've seen some more discoveries. And right now, we have um, close to 11 billion barrels, um, which could proven um, reserve um, that could be extracted. And there are many more exploration taking place. Uh, but at the same time, we've also been accelerating and advancing our commitment in terms of ensuring. Uh, that we not only have an oil and gas sector um, that maintains and operates within world-class and global standards in terms of care and concern for the environment, but at the same time as a country, uh, we're also deploying our ecosystem, our natural resources, and in particular our forest, and I make reference to a forest here, which is the size of England, um, in ensuring that we contribute globally uh, in terms of, of, of fighting climate change. Uh, in addition to that, even as we are moving ahead in oil and gas development, we've, the president of Ghana in uh, October of last year, launched the revised low carbon development strategy. And there was an earlier low carbon development strategy, the first of its kind in the world, which was launched in 2008. And this low, low carbon development strategy outlines the future in terms of our economic and social development and the plans that we have in a non-polluting way. And in that regard, it captures how it is that we are going to approach um, our, our development of oil and gas. Currently as a country, we're 100% reliant on fossil fuel to generate energy. 
and we have one of the highest energy costs um, in the region, close to 31 US cents um, per kilowatt hour. That is the, the cost at cost to consumer in Guyana. We're moving away, or plans we have started work in moving away from reliance on fossil fuel, and we want to move 100% off fossil fuel for our energy needs using a combination of natural gas as well as renewables, hydro, solar, as well as wind. Um, so that is our commitment um, also. So whilst we are pursuing the development of oil and gas, we also have a, a comprehensive, a very strategic, um, and a very practical plan in terms of developing our country in a non-polluting way. Yeah, uh, it's interesting that you say that, and it's very important, uh, an important statement that you make, Mr. Foreign Secretary, because Guyana, being one of the newest oil producers in the world, does it now call for a new module, for lack of a better word, of producing oil and gas, given the emergency and the urgency with which the world has to deal with the changing of the climate? Absolutely. And if you look in terms of, one, we are fully committed to the development and the utilization of our hydrocarbons. You know, we are told that we should leave the oil in the ground. And we're told by people who come from country where, take for instance, um, our per capita income as it stands now is close to 7,000 US. But we're told from people in the developed world, NGOs, and so-called experts that we should leave the oil in the ground, but they, but they are, living in countries where the per capita income is 36,000 US dollars and above. So what should our people do? Should we sacrifice our people's development by leaving the oil in the ground, uh, by not pursuing um, a number of strategic utilization and the development of our natural resources um, and, and, and just let our people perish? Or should we pursue that in a, in a way that is harmonious, that a way that that gels with our, our concerns um, for the environment. Um, you know, and, and, and these, these individuals who tell us, you know, we should forego our economic development, we should forego prosperity for people. Um, as I, and I want to repeat, they are living in countries where they enjoy prosperity and prosperity that was built on the back of oil and gas in many instances for their people. Um, but we are told that we should not pursue that in, in, in that regard. And that is why we are firmly committed, but we want to do it in a way um, that is environmentally friendly. And let's look at the reality. The reality is our cost of production per barrel is the lowest in the world. And I want to repeat that. Our cost of production per barrel is the lowest in the world. Secondly, we do not subsidize exploration. We do not subsidize exploration as, as many other countries do. Um, but we are in very much in, in a mood or plan and our desire is to ensure that the oil and gas sector is done in a way that is also consistent with our international commitments, um, international commitments to the environment in, in this regard. And I want uh, to go back a, a bit before, uh, before you come in a bit about our forests, you know. As I said, the forest is, our forest is the size of England, but our forest uh, contains um, in excess of 19.5 um, gigatons of carbon um, dioxide equivalent. You know, it stores that in excess of 19 um, gigatons of, of carbon dioxide. Um, we have more bird species than the entire United States. And in fact, we have 4% of all known animal species in the world within our forest, and that's, that's intact. And that alone would speak um, to how serious and how committed we are in terms to, to our environment as we pursue the development of oil and gas. You speak about other countries, Mr. Foreign Secretary, that speak to Guyana about keeping the oil in the ground and they are very prosperous. A lot of those prosperous countries that uh, have benefited from oil and gas exploration, uh, a lot of their development within their cities, within their urban communities, uh, so deforestation, uh, can we, with Guyana's rapid development through its uh, founding of oil and gas, can we expect uh, that some parts of some forests in Guyana will begin disappearing over the next decade to make room for development? 
Absolutely not. We have a policy where we will not convert forest one into agriculture, as other countries have done. Two, that we will ensure that we have sustainable logging, sustainable extraction of our forest resources. Uh, we have a clear cut policy um, whereby we have a, a allowable cut level that is, and I can break that down, that is every operator is given a certain amount of, of forest uh, material and logs that it can extract within their concession. Um, and even um, in, in many regards to many of these operators are not even fully utilizing that. So that whilst we have as a policy an annual allowable cut in terms of extraction from the forest, we are even under um, utilizing those, 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 those resources and in terms of not even um, fully maximizing what is allowed. Another point to make too is that we have a verification system that is how it is that we manage and how it is that we, um, we monitor our, our, our forests. And that is internationally verified. So much so that we were the first country to have engaged the government of Norway in, in a program whereby we were compensated as it were for the role of our forests, standing for us in terms of contributing um, positively to climate change um, in, in that area. So our track record speaks for itself. And certainly going forward, we're very firm and very committed to maintaining those policies, to maintaining, uh, as it were, ensuring that our forest continues to contribute. I talk about the 19 plus gigatons of, in terms of its storing carbon di um, dioxide um, in, in our forest. We want to in, ensure that our forest continues to play a part in tackling globally um, the, the, the effects of climate change. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Foreign Secretary. That's a, a, an incredible uh, commitment from the Guyanese people to keep those forests intact, uh, what will perhaps at some point become part of the lungs of the world. I just want to broaden our conversation a little bit, though, from Guyana out a little bit to more to CARICOM. Um, Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley, your colleague, your CARICOM colleague said after COP26, in fact, when he returned from uh, Scotland last day, he said to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago will move away from fossil fuels in a reasonable and manageable way. Those two words being the key, the key ones there. Is Guyana going to take a similar approach as it pursues further oil, its oil and gas production? Well, our, our, our goal is to move 100% off the utilization of fossil fuel. Um, and as, as I pointed out earlier, that is having a mix of utilizing our natural gas. And that project um, is certainly will commence soon. Um, already we've done a lot of work in the development of, what we, of a hydro um, project at the Mile of Falls. Um, that too will be kicking in very soon too. Um, and so all our energy needs will be sourced from um, renewables, as I said, and natural gas, and totally away from fossil fuel. Um, so it is not that we're talking, and we've already started that process. Um, it's, it's, it's a commitment we've given. We've invested money already as a country, and certainly it is part of our low carbon development strategy that is pursuing our development in a, in a non-polluting and a low carbon um, pathway. So, so, so let me ask you this then. Do you feel that CARICOM, as a community, has acted cohesively and decisively enough when it comes to climate change and the effects of climate change that many Caribbean countries are already feeling? We do have a choice as CARICOM not to act uh, because given our vulnerabilities, let's look at the terms of what, right here in Guyana, we have to deal with the issues of flooding. Um, we get one that we are, we're below um, uh, sea level, um, but it's, 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 it's a challenge. Um, and we have, in terms of um, rainfalls, the unpredictability, um, the intensity. Um, and, and so we're very vulnerable here in Ghana. We move out to other sister Caribbean states. We have issues of hurricane um, and, and the ferociousness and the rapidity. Um, you know, when you used to have these climate events, one, one in 100 year, we now see these climate events starting up one in 25 years. Uh, so. The reality is that as a region, we don't have a choice but to take action at the national level, but also regionally, but certainly at the global level, um, given our vulnerabilities. And I think um, many Caribbean states have been stepping up to the task. Do you feel that uh, 
these CARICOM states have a big enough voice at the table? Uh, do you feel like they have a front seat at the table or are, are CARICOM states, small island developing states, I would rather like to broaden that to not just CARICOM states, but small island and developing states have enough uh, you know, leverage at the international level? We, we have been making oral voices heard, uh, but what we find in many instances, many of the commitments made in terms of supporting the types of interventions that are required, both from the standpoint of uh, mitigation and adaptation, these commitments are not being re uh, fulfilled. Uh, we can we, we talk about just recently held COP one day, and it reviewed commitments that were made at the previous COP, where commitments were made at a, an earlier COP, and which we watch consistently that there's that these commitments are not being honored. Um, you know, pledges are made, but you don't see anything that follows. Um, so it is so much we can do, a small island developing state, um, within our own means, and many of us commit, we, given our limited means or given our, our, our emerging economic situation, um, there's so much that we can do at a national level. Um, but when the, uh, globally, when commitments are made, um, especially by the developed countries, um, we don't see that follow through action. We don't see those commitments and those pledges being realized. So yes, we can shout. Yes, we can speak. Yes, we can echo as much as we can. Um, but that is limited until you have the type of response, the type of, of action being given, and the type of commitments made being realized. At this point, I just want to encourage all of our participants, uh, not only do we thank you for being here with us, but please, if you have any questions for the Foreign Secretary of Guyana, Mr. Robert Bassad, please drop them in the question and answer box and we'll definitely try to get them in before this session is over. Uh, Mr. Foreign Secretary, when it comes to access to certain things, let's just say the Green Climate Fund, uh, do you feel it is fair and do you feel it is just for those that really need it in small island and developing states, such as those here in the CARICOM region? You know, it's accessing that fund. It's, it's, and I go back to the, what I, the point I just made, that is that a lot of commitments were made. Um, but in terms of being able to tap those resources, and you make, and that is one, one instance, the Green Climate Fund, um, it, it becomes... Um, as it were, uh, a very difficult task, and I'm putting it very mildly, uh, because you know the, some of the hurdles you have to cross um, in terms of, 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 of tapping into those resources. Um, you know, it it, it 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 takes a lot too out of out of our effort. It takes a lot of our resources even to access um, the, the the type of funds that you refer to, because again, we don't see as it were the consistency in in realization of the commitments made and the pledges made in, in, in many instances. Mr. Foreign Secretary, I just want to pull one question that we have from Nicole Cole and ask it to you. Nicole asks, is the pursuit of people-centered development really harmonious when there are significant damages to the environment by destroying mangrove forests? When ExxonMobil is allowed to flare dangerous gases into the ozone, which further leads to climate change. Do you wish to, to answer that? Um, you know, I, there's no development without some form of um, disruption of, 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 of the natural ecosystem. But one has to manage, one has to take remedial action, as we've been doing. Uh, when I was uh, Minister of Agriculture then, uh, several years ago, we started a program of mangrove restoration. And that program continues today, whereby if you check along our coastline, uh, you can see mangrove um, uh, uh, the, the, the areas there are increasing. A second step that we took in terms of mangroves that we incorporated mangroves into a forest. It wasn't before. So we consider now mangroves part of a forest and that allows us as it were to manage our, our, our mangrove areas um, in, 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 in a much more sustainable, but also give it some legal peak in terms of how it is that do we remove, how it is that um, do we treat our mangroves. So we put the policy action in place. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't think it's, it's an issue for us to be scared. But the issue in terms of flaring of gas, you know, um, Exxon, we've been very, the Environmental Protection Agency has been very uh, firm in Exxon. And in fact, Exxon has been being fined when it has exceeded, um, as it were, um, the, the limits that were set and the caps that were set in the amount that, it's, uh, that it has to flare. And in fact, it had to invest in technology and take remedial action. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's not an issue that has not been given attention. And in fact, they have come back down to a level in which um, that is manageable and, and one in which that is very, um, as we can see, um, friendlier to the environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Sec Mr. Foreign Secretary, for that. Nicole, I hope that answers your question. I also just want to pull another question, this time from Sayoban Shaw. Mr. Prasad, what would help your nation and island nations most right now in the agriculture sector? One of which is, has to be in terms of technology. Um, technology, one in, in to increase production and productivity, technology to deal with the, the threat of climate change, particularly flooding. Um, and so I would rank technology as, as, as number one. Number two, it would be capital investment uh, because we need to scale up. We need to ensure that our farmers and operators, um, that they have access to capital. And that, that is also um, very, very crucial in, in that regard. Nationally, um, we have invested a lot in terms of addressing the issues of, of appropriate um, and applicable technology in terms of incentivizing our farmers and giving them the type of support. Um, and we do that in various means in terms of providing drainage and irrigation, um, reducing the cost of land rental. Um, it's one of the lowest in the world, um, the cost of, of, of farmlands that farmers have access to. Um, we sought to improve and modernize our extension services uh, in both for crops and livestock. Uh, so a number of interventions we've done, we've even created, made Guyana a hub for the region itself, because we have, we're, our president is the lead head on agriculture, and we've made a commitment, he has made the commitment, where by year 2025, we want to reduce the food import bill of the region by 25%. And we see Guyana is taking and playing a lead role in this regard. Um, you know, we bring in um, uh, agriculture uh, personnel from the other regions and training them in Guyana. We're transferring the technologies that we have here to, to our other states in that regard. So we've been doing nationally for our farmers, but also we've been doing it for the region as a whole. Interesting. Pablo Cortinez asks, Mr. Foreign Secretary, how will Guyana get the funding for such an important change in terms of going from fossil fuels to renewable energy when the, comp when the compromise of US $100 billion a year from the developed countries to the developing countries has is yet to be met. You know, we've we've seen the development of our oil and gas sector as not being the backbone of our economy, but rather being an enabler of our economy, both in the short, medium, and long term. And in so doing, um, we've we've come up with a, a suite of interventions to ensure that we're able to finance and to develop the both um, the renewables that we talk about as well as the uh, natural gas sector. Um, and so one of the means and one of the approaches is how, do, how it is that we can deploy and utilize um, our earnings from oil and gas so that we can, one, move in that direction, but also sustain our economy, both in the short to long term. We don't want to go down the road where countries have built everything around oil and gas. And when the oil and gas, one, when, 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 when you have stopped receiving discoveries or seeing discoveries, or when the price collapses as such, your economy is left exposed and vulnerable. We, we have to ensure we are doing it as part of our strategic approach to development in that we have oil and gas, but also oil and gas being, will be used and utilized to develop the traditional sectors, as well as new sectors. Um, the traditional being agriculture and mining, um, for example, um, but also we want to develop a manufacturing sector. We want to develop a viable services sector. We want to develop an eco um, tourism sector. Um, so uh, we, we, you know, it, it's taken that that approach, um, and and one of which, which coming back to the particular question, it's utilizing those resources to um, to ensure that we're able to to meet and to implement the type of uh, plans we have for the energy sector um, for our country. Yeah, I, I just want to tag on a question to that, just to follow up from me. Uh, do you have a timeline for diversification? Uh, that you would like to see, given everything that you have just said? You know, it's, it's work in progress. Um, we've set ourselves target, uh, targets in, in many regards, um, um, but it's work in progress. And, and, and we see developments happening every day in this regard. Um, so it's, things are fast moving in Guyana. We're not waiting. It's, it's, 
what I speak about is things that are happening, things that are emotional. Um, so it's not like a plan and we're, we're now looking how to execute. We, we have started that process um, in, in, in all regards. That is building out a new economy, that is ensuring that the existing um, contributors to our economic growth and development, that those are reinforced, those are made sustainable, but also looking in terms of new sectors and we've started work in that regard. So there's a lot of work taking place. Uh, so it's not a situation whereby we're waiting to start, we have started. Thank you very much, Mr. Foreign Secretary, for that, answering both Pablo and I, our questions. Uh, I have a question from Richard J. We do, we are running out of time, I must tell you, with the Foreign Secretary, who has a very busy day, and we do appreciate all of your questions. I'm going to try to get as many in as possible. Richard J. asks, does Guyana have an estimate of what percentage of gas, solar, wind, and hydro will be utilized for their energy grid in the medium to long term? Additionally, are there fiscal and economic incentives to expedite FDI and local investment? Yes, um, start with the last one for us. Yes, we do have incentives. Um, we have, in fact, it, it's, we call what we, we have there is an, inv we have an investment code and we have an agency that is dedicated to look at investment that is the Guyana Office for Investment. Um, we have a, a, a detailed incentive regime, both for foreign and local investors, because we're not only thinking of, of foreign investors alone, we also think about people who live here and want to invest in the new, new areas that I point to, or even the traditional areas. Um, so we have a very attractive incentive regime um, for investors. Um, going back to the, 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 for the first question in terms of what it is that we, we intend to do in, in, in uh, oil and gas. Um, and if I can get it back, it slipped me the earlier question, uh, just to ensure that I, 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 I answer it um, directly. Sure. Uh, can we pull that one back up, please, guys? All right, let me just pull that one back. Right. Does Guyana have an estimate of what percentage of gas, solar, yeah. wind, and hydro will be utilized? Um, well, as, as I said earlier, we want 100% of our um, energy needs will come from um, gas, hydro, solar, wind. So it's, it's, it's a, a complete, but we can... We, we have some um, estimate what will be our future demand, as it were. Right now, nationally, our peak demand is close to 180 megawatts. Um, we see that growing every day um, because we have a lot of companies to, who produce their own energy. And if they come off that grid, it will immediately um, set up that demand. So um, we, we see that growing constantly, especially when we bring new sectors in, um, new activities in. Uh, so certainly we hope and our desire is to ensure that we remove completely off of fossil fuel um, in terms of our production of energy and, and to have that coming from um, or being generated by either natural gas, hydro, wind, and solar. So a simple answer, yes, 100% um, will, will certainly be generated utilizing renewables and, and, and natural gas. I'm just going to stick one very quick one in, Mr. Foreign Secretary, because I think it's an interesting one. Uh, someone asks in the question and answer chat, are there any benefits to the local communities, of which there are many across uh, parts of Guyana, from floating LNG off the coast? I, I felt that's a very interesting question. Well, you know, the local, the local community, I mean, what we do in Guyana is about all Guyanese. What we do in Guyana is about the benefit of all Guyanese. That is why we passed the Local Content Act to ensure that services and activities within the whole oil and gas sector, that those, those activities are, you know, the benefit um, or people, no matter where they live. If they live in the remotest part or they live in the capital city, we want to ensure that they enjoy, participate and benefit fully. Um, and that is what our development is about. We're not developing Guyana for non-Guyanese. We're developing Guyana for all Guyanese. Um, and so without a doubt, um, the answer is yes. Mr. Foreign Secretary of Guyana, Mr. Robert Passad, I want to say thank you very much for taking part in our session and what is a very busy day for you. We really appreciate your time and your perspective on one of the biggest countries, uh, biggest topics in one of the biggest countries in South America. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I hope, I hope I've been able to add some more perspective and a better understanding um, of what's, what's taking place in Guyana. Uh, because very often we are we are told what's taking place in Guyana by people um, who 
uh, their knowledge and awareness of what's happening in the country is quite limited. Um, so I do hope this afternoon we were able to bring some value added to that to, the, to that perspective and to the greater understanding of what's what's taking place in, in our country. Thank you very much for having me here. Because of your time, Mr. Foreign Secretary, we're all a little bit smarter and a little bit more knowledgeable about what is happening both in Guyana and across the CARICOM region. Thank you very much for being with us. And thank you all very much for participating in this session on balancing both our fossil fuel industry as well as our environmental targets, especially when it comes to green growth in Guyana. We really appreciate your time and we want to wish you a wonderful rest of Friday. Thank you very much.